got to build a lesson plan. Um, and so this is one of your templates. It's a blank page that does a couple of things. It helps you, yes, it takes time, but by doing it, you've got peace of mind that the class is going to stay on track and you're going to hit all of the most important topics. It also makes sure that you've got the main objective, what you want to achieve by the time the class is over. You actually write that into the lesson plan. What's your objective? And then what are your goals? So usually two or three uh, things that you want the students to be able to do in the class is going to get them closer to that objective. And we'll talk more about how to write an objective in a second. Um, and then you just really script out your whole plan. You write down what you want to say in your introduction. You figure out what your exercise or activity is going to be that they do in class to build their business. Then you also have to think about how to explain that activity. And we'll talk about that coming up here, too. Um, any stories that you want to tell, um, sprinkle stories in, just like uh, you know, fine seasoning, just a little bit, cover them here and there as long as they're relevant and they're true. They can be very powerful in bringing your training to life and really making it unique to you. That's what makes the uh, training class yours as opposed to anybody else's. Um, figure out what kind of questions you want to ask of your students. We'll talk about questions in a moment. Um, and then again, just having done this that forces you to visualize the whole class and you'll just feel so much more confident when you walk in there knowing that you've thought as much through as you possibly can, yes, there's going to be unexpected events that will pop up, but you've prepared um, far better than you could if you were just to walk in there and wing it. So again, that's one of the templates that you can download from the webinar today. So the next thing to dive deeper into is, as I mentioned, part of your lesson plan is setting expectations setting objectives and expectations, so figuring out what those are and then stating those very clearly at the beginning of your training session. So the objective is really a fill in the blank. It's what do you want the learners to be able to do or to understand or to think differently about when they leave this class. So your objective is just simply filling in that blank and then after stating your objective, then you're going to have the students let you know what they expect. Are they different from what the objective is? Are they similar? That gives you a chance to say, yes, yes, those will be covered, or actually that topic um, is actually covered in a different class, or here's a resource where you can go to get more. But you're really just kind of setting the boundaries for what the class is going to include and what it's not going to include. And as you see there, the 10 Steps to Train Tomorrow online course features a video one of our master faculty, Sean Rawls, and so he does a really great job explaining how he sets up the class by laying out what the, object, what the objectives are and then how he sets expectations. Okay, so Kevin's going to talk next about introducing yourself. And uh, in introducing yourself, it, it really starts when you walk into the class. So. Of course, we want to arrive to the class early, especially if it's not in our own market center. We need to get there early. We need to make sure we have our directions right. Last thing you want to do is come into the um, come into the class uh, tired and and rushed. So when you walk into the room, you want to walk into the room early. Make sure everything's set up so that as soon as students start walking in, you can introduce yourself. It's so important to introduce yourself prior to the class because you are already creating um, uh, connections with the people that you will be speaking in front of. So a little bit more you get to know about them, the more comfortable that you'll feel uh, in speaking in front of them. You can learn a lot about people and in fact, it can even help you uh, with your introduction or, or throughout the class being able to refer back to them uh, or maybe even some information that you had discussed um, throughout. So really important um, that you, you get there on time and you introduce yourself to the people in the room. Uh, start on time and starting on time is, is extremely vital. We want to uh, respect their time. They took the time out of their business to be there. 
remember, well, I, you probably don't have to remember, you know that real estate agents aren't paid by the hour. Uh, they're typically not staff being in the room. So uh, their time is uh, very um, is very valuable. So we want to start on time. You can also ask permission to start later if there is problems with weather or traffic. You can ask the audience members, uh, Would w can I get your permission to start just a few minutes late, uh, allowing a few others to come here, they will let you know whether they're ready to go um, or whether they're, they're okay to stay. So that, that would also be um, uh, recommended is to uh, start on time or ask permission later. Your introduction has to be very strong. Your first impressions will matter. It will set the tone for the rest of the day. Uh, you want to introduce yourself and, and in fact um, you see on the screen we have Beverly Steiner who is a master faculty and Beverly does an amazing job of uh, talking about her introduction and in her introduction it's what I like to call the elevator pitch in her introduction she is able to tell you who she is how long she has been in the industry how long she has been with Keller Williams um, how long uh, what she has done in real estate and why she's the best person there to be speaking to them about that particular subject. And she does all of this in probably less than one minute. That's what you need to work on is your elevator pitch. Your introduction has to be strong and your introduction isn't always this is what I'm about. You want them to, you want to grab their attention however that is done. If it's about you, that's great. But you want to capture their attention first, then you can tell them about you and we want it, the story about you to be uh, quick and concise. So take a look at the video uh, that Beverly Steiner has on um, the uh, 10, 10 Steps to Train Tomorrow and um, follow, follow that if you can. Brenda. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're kind of walking you through a class. You've got your lesson plan, template, so you're kind of thinking through all of the components of your class. Um, you've laid out the objectives, expectations, you've introduced yourself. Now, as you know, the most important part of any training class is not your lecture. It is the exercises. It's where the students get their hands dirty and start digging into uh, working on their website, whatever it is, um, they're getting their hands on and you've got to, you're going to guide them through an activity. And again, the more you can think this out in advance by writing it into your lesson plan, and then in the classroom, it's not just conducting the activity, but there's a beginning and an ending part too. And to be honest, um, out of the three steps of facilitating exercises, one being introducing it, making sure that you're introducing it clearly. There's no question about what this activity is going to entail and how it's going to work. The second step is actually conducting the activity, and that doesn't mean, okay, go, and standing off to the side or stepping out for a cup of coffee. You're in the room, you're staying engaged, you're keeping your eyes on a student, you're listening to them, uh, you're not stepping in and doing anything for them, you're letting them figure it out, but you're watching. Um, you keep them informed on, you know, we've got 10 minutes left, we've got five minutes left, uh, but be flexible too. If it seems that the activity is taking longer than you anticipated, then be flexible enough to allow a few more minutes or vice versa. Wrap it up faster if people are finishing up and it doesn't feel like it needs to be dragged out. So conducting it is very much um, an active part of this. And then the third is where the real learning happens. That's when you clear the activity. You ask for summaries and ahas, not just your own summary, but ask the learners, what did they get out of it? So when I said be honest, out of the three parts, where is the one that you could improve the most? And I'll, I'll go first. I think introducing it can be challenging. You think you've <laughs> given every single instruction and then someone's got a question you haven't thought of. Um, what other items are all of you working on or could do better on? Simplifying the steps, absolutely. Yeah, again, why it's beneficial to sit down and think through them as much as you can in your lesson plan. Clearing the activity, we're getting some comments that that can be challenging. 
yeah, it's tempting to just wrap it up and move on, but that's really where you want to make sure that they got it, that something actually happened, and, and you want to hear that said back through the student's words and not your own. I have. On track. So we have challenges all over the place here. Go ahead, Kevin. I have trouble, uh, again, with clearing the activity. I think that is the one that uh, most people are, are choosing. And, and there's a couple things that happen. Either, like you said, you try to wrap it up too fast because you want to get moving and you're, you're not um, engaged in, in what they learned and, and the ahas. The other, uh, which is, I think, just as bad, if not worse, is you allow it to go on too long. Um, it, it, it goes beyond the purpose that it served. They start finding other things. Other conversations happen. It turns into a break rather than a lab time and, and a aha time. So um, it, can go, it can go both ways. Mm -hmm. And so some challenges coming in here through the, today's webinar chat. Um, one challenge from Yvette, thank you Yvette, is that when, when you're conducting the activity, you find that everybody just wants to dive in and start, and they're not really watching while you're doing a demonstration, which can lead to questions while it's their turn to do the activity, um, and not getting off on a tangent, another challenge. Yeah, so it's, it's hard work. Um, and then Gail is throwing out a question to all of us. Any help for Gail? How do you handle an agent that repeatedly asks for help but doesn't apply anything, and then they ask questions always unrelated to training. So does anybody have advice? I, I can state what uh, I would do. Having any ideas? Yeah, I do. I have some advice, and then, um, and then you tell us yours. I would say the first thing, Gail, is I would give him or, or her, them, uh, action items uh, the, when they ask a question for something. So I would help them. I'd give them an action item to complete a task that will be relevant to uh, something that they're doing or you're going to know is going to be the next question. When they come to you for additional questions, you first ask, have they completed that uh, first task? So um, that way they know that you're going to hold them accountable to getting the things done. So that, that's one one way I would do it. That's, yeah, my, this came up in our mastermind at Megacamp. I think ask the student what they've done already to solve their own problem. Right. And then when the answer is, well, I really haven't done anything, then that's a conversation you can have, you know, reminding them that the training class isn't there to sit and watch. It's to, to do, to learn new habits. And, um, yeah, and another idea that just came up is to take topics that aren't really part of the class, and you can do this at the beginning or as the class is going along. Um, if somebody wants to know something that really isn't going to be covered in the class, not even close or kind of relevant, write that down on a flip chart in what we call a parking lot. And then if you have time after the class, you can deal with those or, again, direct those students to other resources where they can find their answers. Um, but yeah, and as Joe said, it, it's hard to not get off on tangents, and that can cause tangents to happen sometimes. So it's it's a lot of work, but you know, remember that you're there to kind of keep keep to that lesson plan. Have it there, have it printed out, and look at that lesson plan, and remember that that's today's class, and anything that doesn't fit into that, unless it is important to the whole entire class, um, really should be a parking lot item. And I like Jessica's is pretty simple as they say, great question. Can I get with you um, on a break with that question? Yeah. And that's a good way or to make an appointment offline. Yeah. Offline break. Yeah. The main, the main uh, sentiment there is, right, don't slow down the whole entire class for one person, one off situation or question. So speaking of questions, um, another great video that you will see Oh, and I'm sorry, back to the previous slide. When you're facilitating exercises, Antoinette Perez does a great example of how to do all three of those. She introduces it, gives great instructions. People know exactly that they're supposed to get into pairs, find partners, um, conduct the activity, and then she clears it. So she demonstrates all three steps great. OK, now back to the next slide on using questions effectively. And our master faculty, Holly Perry, models this for you in the course. So reasons why 
you should use questions. Again, the less you tell and the more that you're asking, you're getting the students to think for themselves. And it also lets you know if they're really getting it, if they're learning, or if they've gone down the completely wrong path. When you ask questions of the class, sit with the silence for a while. It can be uncomfortable to be quiet until they answer. They need time to process. And make sure that you acknowledge every answer. Even if it's incorrect, thank that respondent but don't allow the incorrect answer to stand. You want to make sure that you provide the correct information. But do thank everybody who provides any answer at all because they're participating. Um, when you get questions, it's a great idea to repeat the question out loud before you answer it. And why might that be? A couple of reasons why you might want to repeat the question out loud before answering it. Any thoughts on that? Yep. That makes sure one thing is if it's a large room, everybody probably didn't hear the question or they may not have been paying attention. So mm -hmm. this gives everyone a chance to benefit from the question. Just being asked one time, it prevents it from being asked again by someone that may not have been paying attention. Um, it also gives you, it buys you some time to think about your answer. And if you don't know the answer, the fourth goal is that just be honest. It's okay not to know the answer. You're not you don't know everything, and that's okay. Um, admit that. Use that parking lot again and to write down the questions that you don't have an answer for, and then explain when you will follow up or who can get that answer for the class. And I think uh, Cindy hit the nail on the head when she says, uh, what are they really asking? That's, that's really a good question, too. What are they really asking? That's true, yep. Sometimes when you hear your words said back to you, you're like, oh, that's not really what I meant. And then it might prompt them to reword their question. Yep. So, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, Bill, talking about questions, you've got another handout in the webinar control panel. It is a one-page uh, cheat sheet, quick reference, to give you some ideas of questions that you can ask. So it, lists a bunch of questions and puts them into these six groups. So you can ask questions that do these six things in the classroom. You can ask questions just to get people to participate. So if it seems like people are kind of zoning out and you need to get everybody back on track, ask questions that get them to participate, um, such as what are the benefits of what we're going to be talking about or what do you like most about the app. Those are great questions just to get them to participate. Questions also can help you find out what your learners are thinking. So lots of open-ended questions can do that for you. Those also, the third bullet, can extract more information that the whole class can benefit from, or you know, having learners share examples or other points that could be talked about. It just makes the learning experience that much more rich. Um, questions get learners to think more deeply. So by asking why, and why, and why, and what would that do for you, what if, those kinds of questions just really open them up to think more broadly and deeply. Uh, questions also get them to explore both sides of an issue. So what are the benefits, the pros and cons of uh, taking a certain approach to your website, I just keep thinking of websites, for example. Um, or how do you think that looks like from the customer's point of view? So that's a great point of view, that perspective change back and forth between agent and customer, you know, that's a great thing to always bring into your classes, since at the end of the day, that's what this is really all about, is providing great customer experiences. And then finally, questions that encourage the learners to think for themselves. So that sometimes can be you're answering questions with a question. That's a great question. What do you think about that? So again, you've got examples in your handout. Okay, thanks, Kevin. All right, awesome. Um, all right, hey, can you all tell the slides that Brenda works on and the slides that Kevin works on? There's a little bit of a different style between the instructional designer and the <laughs> trainer. <laughs> but it, you know, it's, um, it actually does prove a good point, and we're going to talk about that here uh, in just a little bit because we all have our own different styles of training. And uh, as part of that style of training, um, it's all about your presence in the room. Uh, so we've already told them who we are. They now um, understand why we're there and we have 
uh, the credibility to, to speak to them. So we have their attention. And now that we have their attention, we have to keep their attention. And there are some things that we do and, and can do and some things that we shouldn't do um, when it comes to keeping their attention. And one of them is your, is your posture. So you'll notice I have the, what we call the Superman stance. And that is standing there uh, in a dominant position, um, kind of, he looks kind of like a know-it-all uh, if you look at him there. But it is not, uh, it, it, people uh, standing still, uh, it's difficult to watch. It's difficult for people to engage with someone who is standing still, especially if they're in a dominant position. Uh, think of yourself standing there with your arms crossed. That isn't, a, that isn't an open, inviting uh, a place. Um, hands behind the back, it looks like you're getting ready just to be punched in the gut. So there are, uh, there are stances that you can do and you can't do. You'll notice I have a picture of the rocking horse, and that's just not your average rocking horse. That is the rocking horse that you find on the playground, probably been outlawed by now, um, and those will sway back and forth, and you'll notice there are trainers that do that, and some trainers sway uh, left and right, some trainers uh, sway forward and backward, that can make people seasick, we certainly don't want to be uh, swaying because we're going to lose our attention. And if you think about it, it's a bit of a hypnotic movement. So um, that certainly isn't something that we want to uh, that we want to portray. We want people to be energized uh, and enthusiastic. So you'll notice that we have what we call the Z formation. And the Z formation will keep you from ignoring the left side of the room. Now, if you haven't noticed this, try to take a look at this. Uh, a lot of times when people are speaking in large groups, if they're right-handed, they will typically um, move towards the right of the stage and the center of the stage. The, uh, what we call the, the left-hand side of the stage of the, of, of the presenter side, they can't um, they ignore that side. They tend not to turn in that direction. Um, so if you could incorporate what you call the Z movement, uh, it is a little bit easier to then engage with the audience. You can move uh, back and forth and, and, and left and right. And that way you're engaging everybody and nobody feels left out because you are really making an entire side of the, um, you're making the entire side of the, uh, of the room uh, uh, just feel simply left out. If you normally stay a couple of paces back from your audience, then you can uh, put in, uh, you can incorporate closeness uh, to uh, emphasize a point. Moving close to people is really powerful. Sometimes it's intimidating and it's okay to be. If any of you have ever been in a training or in a session with Sherry Lewis, she will literally put her knuckles on the table of the person she's speaking to and lean forward and have a conversation with them. That is a powerful statement, and it is a really great way to engage your audience. And you can do that in several places throughout your presentation. So look for that. You get a powerful effect. Uh, you're not intimidating, uh, but it is a great way to, to bring across a point that you really want uh, uh, brought, uh, brought across. There's some other things you can do, such as when you're talking about something negative or a lesser than, you step backwards. If you, is something that is positive and it's in a forward, uh, and, and it's moving forward, you move forward. You use your hand motions and so forth. So uh, talking about that, we're going to talk a little bit about body movement. Uh, you could use your, your body to make a point or when you're telling a story. Your hands and your fingers are very powerful. Now, um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of cultural um, things that will, will make a person use their hands a lot, which is great. But too much movement can be distracting. So be purposeful about your hand movements. When you are counting, use your uh, pinky to start with one, then the next finger two, uh, third finger three, and so forth. Uh, that is a lot different than the, um, the, your regular one, two, three. It's a, it allows you to bring your hand uh, up 
and uh, show the, the each of your figures. So that's a great way. Uh, keeps a keeps the audience engaged if you're telling a story. And here's the thing: if you are um, if you are not a high eye, but you have great information to share, and you are a great trainer, if you can incorporate physical movement, that um, is probably more powerful than anything you can do because people typically don't see you animated. And if you can animate yourself uh, at any point during your presentation, it will draw them out. It, it makes you... Um, it makes you human. Um, and in fact, uh, director of the White House uh, speech writing department said that um, business executives, political leaders have embraced humor because humor works. Um, using humor in public speaking helps uh, you accomplish the following. That's arouses interest, helps you connect with the audience, it disarms any hostility, and it shows that you don't take yourself too serious. And, and everybody wants that in a great training. All right, now let's talk about what happens to all of us, is, and that's anxiety. So, you know, as trainers, we don't always have control of how many people uh, are going to be in the room. It may be too few than we expected or many, too many than we expected, and we have, to, we have to be aware of this, and we have to be able to handle this. So uh, when we're dealing with large or small audiences, we treat them exactly the same. Uh, you, you may have to engage a smaller audience even more, but it is the same trainings, and don't cheat anyone out because you feel like your class is too large or too small. Always try to have someone there that can help you to facilitate any questions. If it's a larger class, maybe they can help uh, make sure that everybody's uh, plugged in. So that's one of the things you can do. Another thing you can do when it comes to anxiety uh, is be prepared for anxiety. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but there are some things that you can have in your back pocket in case you forget where you are um, in a uh, section of, of the presentation. You just go to that thing in your back pocket and you bring that out. You can also take that opportunity to take a break, uh, to uh, do a breakout, have, have some things uh, prepared in case something happens that takes you off your game. It's really important to, to, to be prepared with that because th that anxiety can just get worse. And, and you may even be able to, to get away with not anybody even knowing what happened. So have that available. I also like to have what we call a smile partner. A smile partner is someone that you have already arranged with that is going to be in the class. You're going to tell them, if I start getting nervous or I need some support, I'm going to look at you and all I expect from you is a smile. A smile partner can help get you back on track as well. Um, help you um, if you ask a question and no one else answers a question, your smile partner can be the person to do that. So always take advantage uh, of a smile partner. And then uh, the last is, um, is the um, reading, the monitor, or the screen. You know, the screen is for the audience. It's, it's only a guide. It, it's not a list um, to, to read from. And one of our biggest mistakes as trainers uh, is that we will read from the, um, read from the slide as if it's story time. It's, it's not story time. Uh, the slide is a reference, and it is not to be read. Uh, word for word. And you have seen in our presentation that both uh, Brenda and I have put together, Brenda had uh, some some words and some terms up there, and she used them only as guides uh, to and followed, uh, followed along, but she gave a lot more description of what was on there. I like to use a lot only graphics and then have uh, the information um, provided that is relative to the graphic. It's, it's a, a, a way that uh, we can we can train uh, visually. So everybody has their their different styles. Uh, tell me though, those of you that are are, are still on the call, uh, what are some ways that you can avoid uh, reading the screen? What are some things that you can do to avoid having to read the screen word for word? And Laura came in like right off the right off the bat, and she said, "Know your stuff." You're exactly right, Laura. One is that you need to know the presentation. If you have animations in the presentation, and as you're doing your presentation and you're clicking through those animations, and they're happening throughout your uh, your conversation, 
it is really going to appeal to the audience. They are going to, one, know your stuff, and they're going to be able to follow the flow rather than waiting for you to, to push the, the button pointing the, the clicker at, at the screen. Uh, I like what Robert said, don't use sentences, just have um, um, just words or just quick terms, things that are there, because that way you can't read off the screen. Uh, Heather, once again, practice what you're going to say. Um, and I like Joe's, uh, Joe's got a good uh, trick there, have the monitor in front of you so that you don't ever have to turn your back. You can absolutely have two monitors, one that shows your presentation, the other that has uh, the information on the screen. All right. Have your own bullet points. Oh, have your own bullet points. It helps you to keep uh, on track as well. And I'll add one more thing. It's okay to have a, a list of notes with you. If you have all of your stuff written on notes, that's totally acceptable. A lot of times I see trainers do that. Most times they don't even use them, but they're kind of, uh, they're there just to uh, as, as a support blanket, if you will. So um, that's okay too. It's always good to have your notes in your hand. All right, we are just a little bit over time. Brenda, you want to talk about next week's schedule? Sure, I'll do it real quick. Um, you can read. <laughs> so we're going to do Monday, <laughs> we're back with the Systems for Success, and this is going to be all about organizing contacts in eEdge. Um, which again we do so that launching marketing campaigns to specific groups goes more smoothly. Um, KW Video, don't know what the specific topic is going to be yet. They like to announce that pretty close to the day, but it's the weekly KW Video live training. And then Calvin and I are back next Friday for the ambassador webinar. All right. And we want to thank you all for being here as you well, no, it is September 11th, and we just wanted to take a moment to uh, for our remembrances and um, and uh, those uh, loved ones all around. And uh, we want you all to be safe this weekend. Have uh, have a great rest of your Friday. We really appreciate it. If you have any uh, questions regarding today's content or anything at all, you can always email us at ambassadors at kw.com. And uh, we look forward to talking to you all next week. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Have Adam. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye, everyone.